grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, it's back to school time, right? So I want you to imagine a classroom with a handful of students. Everybody's sitting in their desks in these nice little rows. Teachers standing in front of the room. And it's time for a pop quiz. The teacher looks at the students and says, Who do people say that I am? When I hear today's gospel reading, I can't help but imagine teacher Jesus standing in front of the room asking this to his dutiful students. Maybe James was the one who raised his hand and said, uh, some people say you're John the Baptist. Maybe John then said, or Elijah. Maybe Bartholomew spoke up and said, or one of the other prophets like Jeremiah. Teacher Jesus probably nodded his head a bit and then said, okay, but who do you say that I am? Then there was a bit of silence. They knew what they were supposed to say, but who would have the guts to say it out loud? Suddenly, Peter spoke up. Right? He's not afraid to talk. In fact, sometimes he opened his mouth before he thought about what he was supposed to say. Like now, he didn't even bother raising his hand. He just blurted out, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus gives a big... Sigh of relief and said, well done, Peter. You get an A+. Plus. The other disciples kind of looked at Peter. Some thought he was being a teacher's pet and a know-it-all. Some of them were surprised he didn't say something stupid. Some thought that now they could cheat off of him and copy his homework. Right? It's really easy to imagine a scene like this because we all know what classroom settings are like. But the thing is, a classroom setting is a safe environment, right? It's a training ground. You can say the wrong answer in the classroom, be corrected, and then it doesn't really have a big effect on life outside that room. And because it doesn't have a big effect, sometimes students will say, when am I ever going to use this in the real world? Right? They complain that what they're doing doesn't really matter in daily life. So it's a good thing then that Jesus did not ask this question in the safe environment of a classroom. Instead, he asked it out in the real world, where it definitely matters in daily life. You see, this scene takes place in Caesarea Philippi. And most of the time when we hear place names in the Bible, they don't really mean a whole lot to us. Right? We focus on the characters and the events of the story, not really the setting. But the setting here really matters. Caesarea Philippi was a city built by Philip, who was the son of Herod, to honor Caesar Augustus. So you could kind of think of it like Philip's Caesarville. Right. This city made it clear that the Roman Empire ruled the world and Caesar was to be worshipped. It emphasized all the powerful gods of Rome. Everything you looked at, everything you heard, everything that people were doing was all focused on how Rome worked. And it was there not by the Sea of Galilee or in downtown Jerusalem or even in a safe environment of a classroom that Jesus asked his question. Who do you say that I am? He was asking this question out in the real world with lots of cultural voices all around him. Think of it this way. If you were to make a painting 
with the theme of America, what would you paint? Would it be Washington, D.C., with all of our politics and our history? Would it be something like New York City, with all of the commerce and the shopping? Would it be more like a Norman Rockwell type of painting? You know, like small town America, baseball games and apple pies and suburban homes with the flags on the front porch? However you picture American culture, some people see Jesus fitting right in with that. They think you're not really an American if you're not Christian. They like to emphasize in God we trust and one nation under God and all that good stuff. And in one sense, Christians do have it pretty easy here in America. We're not persecuted. Nobody's going to kill you for coming here to worship on Sunday morning. You're not going to get arrested if you get caught reading the Bible. But then again, being a Christian in America is hard. Because Jesus pushes against culture. Jesus calls us to a life of radical discipleship. A life that doesn't really fit with the me first, I'll do whatever I want, I'm important because people follow me on social media kind of mentality. So then how would we answer Jesus' question? As we live in the midst of American culture, who do we say Jesus is? When we hear all the voices of instant gratification and individualism and independent behavior, who do we say Jesus is? Is he just one option among many? Is he some famous figure from the past who said some really good inspirational quotes? Is he somebody who makes sense here in the safe environment of this sanctuary on Sunday morning, but who doesn't really matter out in the rest of our lives the rest of the week? Some people think that way. Or, instead of thinking about all the external voices around you, think about the voices in your head. Sometimes those are more challenging. When you're going through a crisis, when you hear all of those voices of doubt and fear and uncertainty in your head, who is Jesus then? When your life seems to be falling apart around you, who is Jesus then? When you have no idea what your future holds, and that terrifies you, who is Jesus then? Of course, we know what we're supposed to say, right? We're supposed to copy Peter's homework. We're supposed to say, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And sometimes we do that. Like when we come together for worship, we profess our faith with the words of the creed. But sometimes saying Peter's answer can just feel like we're saying the words that we know we're supposed to say. In fact, sometimes the world around you is trying to tempt you away from following Jesus. And sometimes those voices in your head tell you that this faith stuff isn't really worth it at all. It's at those times that Peter's answer gets put to the test in the real world. Setting matters. 
whether it's modern day America or those dark places in your own head. But there is something really important to remember here. All of those voices, those outside of you and those within you, cannot change the fact that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. No matter what the culture around you says, and no matter what those negative whispers in your mind tell you, Jesus' identity does not change. The fact that he is the Messiah is not dependent upon how easy or hard it is for you to trust it. No, the fact that he is the Messiah is dependent upon the love and grace of God, which never change. So that means that when Peter said this line, it was both a political statement and a faith statement. It was political in the sense that since Jesus is the one in charge, that means the emperor is not in charge. It means our allegiance is to Jesus and not to this world. And it's a faith statement because even when it's hard for us to trust him, he is still the Messiah. And that's why, after Peter said this, Jesus told him, You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Now, let's be clear. Peter is not the rock on which the church is built. Peter is a sinner, like you and me. Yes, he loved Jesus, but he said and did some really stupid stuff, just like we do. No, the church is built on the truth that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. That is the rock on which we stand. Jesus is the church's one foundation, not Peter. And because of that truth, not even the gates of Hades can prevail against it. Now remember, Hades does not mean hell. Hades is the underworld, the place of the dead. It's the Greek term for the Hebrew word Sheol, which is just the place you go when you die. Don't let your minds think of images from Dante's Divine Comedy, which aren't biblical anyway. Plus, Bethany Iverson from Fried Hardman University in Tennessee wrote an article saying that the gates of Hades was a term used for one of the caves there in Caesarea Philippi. It was where the sacrifices to the god Pan were thrown. So it was basically a site of pagan worship. So by saying that the gates of Hades would not prevail over the church, Jesus is saying that the surrounding culture, and even death itself, would not silence the church. Today, we might say what, that the elephant and the donkey will never crush the church. At first, the imagery might sound strange, especially to anybody outside American culture, but I see some of you smiling because you understand what I'm talking about. If you recognize that those are the symbols of our political parties, then it means American culture, symbolized by our politics, will not prevail over the church. In the same way, 
all of those doubts and fears and uncertainties in your head, those will never bring it down either. Even when we are afraid, Jesus is still the Messiah. Even when we worry, Jesus is still the Messiah. Even when we fall into the trap of scarcity, Jesus is still the Messiah. And our life together as the church is built on him. Not upon our own feelings. And no matter how we feel, no matter what all of those voices say, Jesus says that we are still his church, too. Right? This text isn't just about who Jesus is. It's also about who we are. Jesus is still the Messiah, and we are still his church. And so whether you're in Caesarea Philippi, Washington, D.C., New York City, small town America, Dayton, Ohio, or even in your own head, Jesus is always the Messiah, and we are always his church. Now, how's that for something that matters in the real world? In the name of the one who is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.